Hello and welcome to Game Sack. We are back with Game Battle 2. Six more amazing battles that are going to keep you on the edge of your seat. And whatever we say, whatever game we say wins, that's it. No extra discussion. That's it, right, Joe? Final. Sure, yes. And there can only be one winner in each of these battles. So mm -hmm. without further ado, let's get to it. <laughs> Return Fire on the PlayStation versus Mass Destruction on the Sega Saturn. Which is the better arcade-style tank game? Let's start out with Mass Destruction. This one's also on the PlayStation and PC. This is a single-player game, so if you're looking for multiplayer action, you must go elsewhere. But if you're like me and really enjoy single-player experiences along with multiplayer, then keep listening. The premise of this game is simple, and that is you must destroy everything in sight. Well, you don't have to destroy everything, but it's fun to try. You start out by choosing one of three tanks to command. They vary in terms of armor and speed. After that, you start the destruction by picking a mission to complete. Controlling your tank is very straightforward, and you can even move the turret if that helps you. You're equipped with infinite machine gun ammo and basic shells. Honestly, these are enough for you to complete a mission, but just for fun, you can pick up new weapons inside a level. You can switch between these weapons on the fly, and for the most part, they're really fun and usually deal more damage. Their only problem is that they have a limited amount of times that you can use them. Surprisingly, you can take quite a bit of damage. There's no real worries though, as picking up first aid boxes heals your tank. Each level is loaded with enemies to take out. You fight other tanks, of course, and every now and then bombers and helicopters will try and take you out. The best, though, is the enemy infantry that's all over the place. I love the death screams when you run them over. Buildings, fences, and trees are all destructible and can have hidden power-ups, so it's worth it to destroy everything. The graphics are pretty nice and run at a constant 60 frames per second. The music is good, and I like the synth as it totally reminds me of the music of the time. If there's one downfall to this game, it's that you only have one life. Now let's take a look at Return Fire, which is also on the 3DO and PC. In this one or two player game, the object is simple, capture your enemy's flag. The game has over 100 maps for you to play. These range from small maps that take maybe 10 minutes or less to complete to huge maps that will take more than one hour to complete. To do this job, you have an assortment of vehicles at your command. A helicopter, which of course can fly anywhere and can blow up landmines, but it has barely any armor, so it's very fragile. You have a tank, which is decent in speed, but has light armor. You have the mobile missile launcher, which is heavily armored but very slow, and finally you have a jeep that is quick but has no armor. The jeep is required to transport the captured flag back to your base for victory. Everything in this game is destructible. Trees, plants, buildings, bridges, you name it, it can be destroyed. Unlike mass destruction, there's no enemy tanks in this game but loads of missile turrets. They do have small helicopters, which can be shot down thanks to your tank and mobile missile launcher being able to shoot upwards. Enemy soldiers will flee from buildings that you're destroying and they will try and lob grenades at you. They're useless little flies and you can squash them just like a bug with a satisfying squishy sound and all that's left is a blood stain. Your vehicles don't have a life bar but you can tell how much damage it's taking by how big the yellow ring gets on your radar. A certain amount of strategy is needed on the bigger map since the flag can be hidden in one of many buildings. The music in this game is perfect. Each vehicle has its own classical theme, like Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries for the helicopter. Return Fire versus Mass Destruction! Winner, Return Fire! This was a very tough call since both of these games are really fun and each has its own strengths and weaknesses. I really like the missions in Mass Destruction and the little to no strategy, the mindless destruction, and I like the variety in weapons you can get. Return Fire just has a bit more going for it. I like slowly whittling away at your enemy's defenses on the mega maps in search of their flag. The music, as I said before, is amazing and it makes me want to turn up the volume. I do like a good single player game, but the game excels in two player mode. Memories of chasing down my friend's jeep that has my flag and destroying it with my helicopter and many more like this. Return Fire wins, but you cannot go wrong with mass destruction. <laughs> Team 
Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4 Turtles in Time on the Super Nintendo versus Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles The Hypersone Heist on the Sega Genesis. Which is the better 16-bit Turtles beat-em-up? Alright, Turtles in Time came out on the Super Nintendo before Hyperstone Heist came to the Genesis, so let's talk about that one first. This game is a port of the second Turtles arcade game by Konami. And as you can see, they did a pretty damn good job bringing it home. It's not a perfect port by any means, as things have been changed, removed, or even added. But it is still damned awesome. The story behind this one is that Shredder steals the Statue of Liberty for some reason, and now it's up to you to retrieve it. You can try to get it back all by yourself or with a friend. Fighting through the first four areas, it doesn't feel too much different than the first Turtles arcade game. But then you defeat Shredder and he sends you on a journey through time, hence the name of the game. What follows are stages that take place in different parts of history. Like this one where pterodactyls are dropping things on you because even dinosaurs want you dead. Or this one in the Old West on a train. What's funny is that Shredder even sent his goons back in time to defeat you. But seriously, what's the point? If you go back in time 2.5 billion years, I don't think you're gonna live long enough to stop Shredder in 1992. I mean, come on, there's a lot of zeros in that year there. After defeating each boss, you travel to a new time period, somehow. Eventually, you even go into the future. And of course, being in the future, you get Mode 7. This stage was actually not in the arcade version. The action all controls well enough, though I recommend turning off the auto dash in the option screen. In this one, you can toss the enemies at the screen. They get blocky, but this is not Mode 7. It's just animated tiles. In fact, there's really nothing that impressive about it, especially at only three frames. The graphics are very close to the arcade and fantastic throughout. Lots of bright colors everywhere. The animation isn't as good as the arcade, but it gets the job done. You can change the color from animation to comic if you like. This makes the turtles themselves darker and more drab like the comic books, whereas the animation looks brighter like the cartoons. Maybe even brighter than that. This only affects the turtles and not anything else in the game. The music is absolutely spectacular, as was often the case with Konami games back then. The tunes are all extremely memorable and even worth listening to outside of the game when you're not playing. This is definitely a must-have for the system. Later that very same year, Hyperstone Heist was released on the Sega Genesis. It's also kind of a port of the arcade game, but not really. Nintendo had an exclusivity contract on Turtles in Time, so Konami had to change some things around. In this one, Shredder uses the Hyperstone to shrink not only the Statue of Liberty, but also the entirety of Manhattan. So right away, this game has way more at stake than the one on the Super Nintendo. And that's why you should buy it. Nah, just kidding. The two-player beat-em-up action is more or less the same in most aspects. Dashing now has its own button and it doesn't always seem to work for some reason. Also, you can no longer throw enemies directly at the screen. This isn't a huge loss, but it was fun to do in the Super Nintendo game. The gameplay also feels slightly faster, but unless you play the games back to back, you probably won't notice much of a difference. Many of the stages are brand new and not in either the arcade or the Super Nintendo versions. And that's what really sets this game apart. Most stages even have multiple areas to them with their own music. There is one area though that's a palette swap of another and it repeats all of the bosses that you fought previously up to that point. Graphically the game looks good, but less colorful than Turtles in Time. I feel that the animation is slightly better though. And it also has the comic color mode if you like that sort of thing. One thing I definitely don't like is that large black bar behind the status info. Oh, and the music has gotta be worse on the Genesis, right? I mean, it's the Genesis, it's gotta suck. Well, I don't know about that. It's still outstanding here, and the sound quality is actually more like the arcade than the Super Nintendo game is. Although a few tracks are definitely better on the Super Nintendo, I really like the music here in Hyperstone Heist, maybe even a bit more. Turtles in Time has a very staccato sound to the notes that compose it. And if you don't know what staccato means, look it up. So personally, I kind of prefer the non-staccato version. But I've got to admit, the voices here are a million times worse. Turtles in Time versus the Hyperstone Heights! Winner! Turtles in Time! Overall, I've got to give the edge to the Super Nintendo game. It just has more variety. That forced boss rush stage in Hyperstone Heist brings it down several notches. So do the voices. In fact, I'd rather have no voices than these voices. My toes, my toes. 
The music is amazing in both games, and so is the gameplay. Neither really seems longer than the other when you get down to it, and the difficulty is about the same in both games. However, Hyperstone Heist costs a hell of a lot more. Tailspin on the NES versus Tailspin on the Genesis versus Tailspin on the TurboGrafx-16. Which is the best console game about Tailspin? All right, let's start out with the NES version. This game by Capcom is a side-scrolling shooter and Rebecca Cunningham sends you on eight different assignments that of course make up each level of the game. You have to collect money and cargo as you fly through each level. The game starts you off way underpowered. I mean, the Sea Duck can only have one bullet on screen at a time, so choose wisely when you want to shoot your weapon. If you can make it past the first level, you have a chance. After that, you can upgrade your plane so it can have rapid fire. The game boils down to pattern memorization, and once you have that down, you'll do pretty well. The Sea Duck is a weird controlling plane here. Aside from flying it forwards, you can fly it upside down and backwards. It's very strange at first, but once you realize when and where to use this, it makes sense. Even after you get rapid fire and a hang of the controls, the game is far from easy. There's many areas where it's nearly impossible to dodge attacks and you just hope you can ride it out. Well, at least that's what I did. Just like most Capcom games of the day, there's hidden stuff everywhere that will reveal itself when you shoot it. There's even hidden bonus levels where you control kit, cloud surfing, and popping balloons. The game controls well and is graphically on par with all other Capcom Disney games of that era, and that's good. The music is also enjoyable, but no tune really stands out as being amazing. Let's move on to the Turbo Graphics version. In this side-scrolling platformer, you take control of Baloo and you're trying to piece together an ancient symbol and unlock the secrets to the power of the universe. You can choose which order you want to tackle the levels in. At first glance, the game looks pretty good. The graphics are fairly nice, clean, and colorful. All the character sprites look nice and animate well. Maybe they animate a little too well as Blue suffers from control issues. For example, when he lands from a jump, he is momentarily paralyzed to do anything else. So if you're being attacked or need to make another jump right away, it's not gonna happen. Your button press will feel dead and this will lead to many deaths. You know what else will lead to many deaths? Baloo is very fragile and easily takes damage. For example, in the ice level, if Baloo hits his head on the ceiling, he loses life. That's a bit unfair if you ask me and makes the game more frustrating than fun. The difficulty level is pretty steep in this game. Baloo can throw things at his enemies, which is great, but these enemies will also throw things at you. At times, there's so many enemies coming at you and they're all throwing projectiles. It can be pretty damn hard to dodge them and before you know it, your life bar is gone. If you do manage to get past a stage, then you get a bonus level where you fly the Sea Duck. You control the plane while Kid is cloud surfing behind it. It's difficult to control, but you can collect points that are floating in midair and even a continue which you're gonna need if you want a chance at completing the game. Now let's take a look at the Genesis version. In this game, Baloo is trying to win a contest for a lifelong air transport contract for his company, Hire for Hire. You take control of Baloo or Kit in a single player game or you can even do two player simultaneous play. The object of each level is to collect 10 crates to open the goal. One to collect for the contest which has a white band on it and the other plain looking crate to use as a platform. You can hold three of these plain ones at a time and place them wherever you want. This game's pretty close to the turbo version in its difficulty scale. And again, the culprit is bad control. Baloo and Kit both have a projectile attack, but it's not very accurate. The level design is far from great. There's way too many random things going on that'll quickly drain your life bar. Things like these stupid crabs that cling on to you. They regenerate and are just completely annoying. Just like a real STD crab. Random water fountains also hurt you. How in the hell can a water fountain hurt you? It's all over the place here along with those stupid crabs. There's many more instances like this and it's just horrible level design. At least the game breaks up the action at times with a side-scrolling shooter. Of course, you're flying the Sea Duck, which is abnormally large compared to the enemy planes. Flying these missions feels pointless since enemy planes are everywhere and it would be impossible not to take damage. But at least there's plenty of icons to collect to refill your life.
Tailspin versus Tailspin versus Tailspin. Winner, Tailspin. On the NES. You know me, and the fact that I prefer platform games over shooters almost any day of the week. Sadly, the platformers on the Genesis and the Turbo Graphics had too many issues for them to be properly enjoyable. If the Turbo Graphics version didn't have bad controls, that game would have been really fun and would have easily been my top choice. The Genesis version really has poor level design and just feels unfair. The NES version, while seeming unfair at first, is more enjoyable when you memorize the patterns. I'm not saying that the NES version is amazing, and in fact none of these versions are great, it's just that the NES version is the best of these bad games. Maybe I should try Tailspin games on the Game Gear and the Game Boy. Eh, yeah, maybe not. All right, we're back. Dave, you mentioned that there are uh, handheld versions, Game Gear and Game Boy versions of Tailspin. Think you're gonna battle those two ever, or are you just done with Tailspin? Yeah, I'm done with Tailspin. I mean, that was that was pretty painful to play mm -hmm. all three of those games, and it was more like a really of a battle of which is the best of the worst, the cream of the crap, <laughs> as they say. So I, you know, I'm, I think I'm done with Tailspin. Okay. But, uh, I don't know. What do you guys think so far? I mean, these are some insanely close battles. Have you guessed any of them before we were finished with it? I don't know. You tell us in the comments. Yeah. And let's get back to these battles. Gunstar Heroes versus Contra Hardcore. Which is the best running gun on the Genesis? This is going to be a tough one. Anyway, Gunstar Heroes from Treasure came out first in 1993. As many of you know, Treasure was formed by ex-Konami employees who got sick of Konami's BS. They formed Treasure so they could make the games that they wanted to make. And this cool little run and gun was one of the first things that they did. Basically, M. Bison from Street Fighter 2 and some of his friends are causing some ruckus and the only solution is to blow them to bits. At first, the game seems like a fairly simple two-player run and gun, but it gets much deeper than that. You have four different weapons that you can collect. You can hold two weapons at any time and turn them on and off with the A button. When they're both on, they combine. So if you have two of the same type of weapon, you'll have a more powerful version of that weapon. You can also mix and match different weapons to get new weapons that do very weird and wonderful things. Before you start the game, you can choose between a fixed shot or a free shot. This makes you either locked when firing or able to move when firing. Personally, I always choose the free shot. You have a life meter represented by numbers at the top of the screen. The bosses also have this same meter to represent their health. It's odd, but I like it. Also, throughout the game you'll encounter hearts which restore your life. And the key here is to keep your energy as high as you can because if you do, your life meter will go way above 100. For example, I was able to get my life all the way to 286 here and I'm sure others have gotten it even higher. And this can really help in the latter half of the game. The gameplay is usually very fun with many intense moments. It tries some quirky things for a running gun, like this dice maze where most of the rooms offer a unique challenge. Unfortunately, this is kind of slow and you usually end up having to go all the way back to the start. And there's even the shooter stage during the second half of the game. Overall, the graphics are bold, bright, and fantastic. It has a cartoony look that really suits the game. And not to mention tons of special effects all over the place from the masters at Treasure. The music also fits the game and some of it borders on excellent. It sounds bright, spacious, and very unique to the game. This is a must have for sure. Another must have on the Genesis is Contra Hardcore from Konami released in 1994. This is a follow-up to Contra 3, though they didn't call it Contra 4 for some reason. This game is quite a contrast to Gunstar Heroes. In fact, it's almost as if this game exists solely to give the employees who left Konami a big middle finger. This two-player game is truly hardcore. It's dark, gritty, and super fast. It's like Konami is telling Treasure that they can go to hell with their wimpy Gunstar Heroes because this is where it's at. But it's tough, really tough. You'll die a lot. But once you memorize all of the patterns in the game, it's not as bad as it first seems. Now, there's no difficulty select, but there is a character select, and you might have the best luck if you choose the small robot Brown. Since he's so small, he's a lot harder for the enemy to hit, and he has a sweet-ass double jump. The controls can be kind of confusing at first. 
The A button cycles through your weapons, but only when you're not firing. If you're firing and you press it, then it switches between fixed and free modes, locking you into place if you weren't. The X, Y, and Z buttons also switch back and forth between fixed and free, regardless of if you're shooting or not. And I find that I often have to switch between the two modes throughout the game. At a couple of points, you can choose the next stage, and this leads to more replayability. The game has multiple endings as a result, and I've personally seen two so far, not counting the fake one. That's about as deep as the play mechanics get in this game. One hit and you die. You also have a limited number of continues. The graphics are dark, grainy, and generally not as pleasing as those in Gunstar Heroes. In fact, I still contend that this dinosaur looks like he belongs in an NES game with the nasty tiled shading that he has going on. Stupid dinosaur, he can't even shade himself without looking all blocky. Dumbass. However, the game moves sprites around like nobody's business. It's insane. There are also some great special effects here and there. The music is good, but pretty gritty and also very abrasive sounding. It doesn't really do anything special with the Genesis's sound hardware, but it still sounds way better than, say, a Western programmed game, at least most of them. But the guitars here have absolutely nothing on Thunder Force 4. Gunstar Heroes vs. Contra Hardcore! Winner! Contra Hardcore! This was a really tough decision as both games are phenomenal. Really, you should own them both. But in the end, Gunstar Heroes has a few things that just bring it down. First is that shooter level. It feels very slow and much too long for its own good. On the flip side though, there's this thing in Contra that goes on for way too long and it's equally annoying. Also, the dice maze in Gunstar Heroes is very tedious. I enjoyed it the first couple of times I played the game back in the 90s because it was so unique to me, but it grew old very fast. Also, in Gunstar Heroes, the enemies will often grab and hold you, and I cannot stand this. I feel as if my controller has been unplugged for a few seconds while I struggle to free myself. Gunstar Heroes does have better graphics, music, and more personality, but Contra Hardcore just plays better. This was a close call, and you really can't go wrong with either game. Commando on the NES versus Guerrilla War on the NES. Which is the better overhead run and gun starring a commando using Guerrilla War tactics? First up is Commando from Capcom. This arcade game was ported to the NES in 1986. You play as Super Joe, a one-man killing machine who must infiltrate and take down the evil Empire Army. You start the game off by being dropped off by a helicopter. The chopper takes off as you wave goodbye and happily begin your one-man massacre. Joe is equipped with a machine gun that has infinite ammo. He also has grenades, but they aren't infinite and you have to pick up icons to refill your supply. I'm using the NES Advantage to play this game and yes, it's given me the advantage. Turning the turbo on really makes mowing down enemies easy. The grenades are nice and useful, but you can only chuck them up the battlefield and not wherever you'd like. Besides killing guys behind walls, the grenades will also uncover hidden bunkers. These are a nice addition to the gameplay and have different things in them from POWs to weapon power-ups. Not different weapons, but just a more powerful gun that can shoot further than the base gun. There's four levels and each consists of four areas to fight through for a total of 16 missions. It sounds like a lot, doesn't it? But the thing is that after you beat the fourth area, you're brought back to the beginning again and it turns into level two. So in essence, there's only four missions that get tougher and tougher with each playthrough. Still though, sometimes you feel like you're fighting the dumbest army in the world. They'll follow you without shooting at you and it's pretty easy to dodge them. There's no real bosses, and at the end of each level, you just need to survive a horde of soldiers coming at you. After that, you have a quick smoke break, and it's on to the next mission. There's only one real song in this game, and it's a very catchy melody. It loops and repeats, but luckily it doesn't get too annoying. You have infinite continues that'll start you off at the beginning of the mission that you're fighting on, so yes, the game can be beaten with a bit of patience. Now for Guerrilla War by SNK, released on the NES in 1989. In this one or two player game, you play a freedom fighter fighting to free your island from an evil dictator. Here's a fun tidbit. The Japanese arcade version has Che Guevara and Fidel Castro as the main protagonists. 
Anyway, as you fight your way through this island, you can free hostages for mega points. Be careful though, because if you kill them, you get points deducted from your score. Killing enemies will reveal weapons that you can pick up. These are nice, powerful, and fun to use, especially the flamethrower, which has a wide range. You also have infinite grenades, and you can throw them in any direction that you like. Every now and again, you'll run across a tank for you to command. Hop in and blast away. These are fun to drive and do lots of damage, but they don't last very long, so get out when it starts to beep at you or you're gonna die. Your enemy is much smarter in this game. He also has tanks and helicopters at his disposal, so be ready. And if that's not enough, a boss is waiting to fight you at the end of each level. After you defeat the boss, you move up on a map screen and you get a quick briefing on what your next mission will be. This game also has infinite continues that'll start you right off where you died. The music is much more diverse in this game, though the melodies aren't as catchy. Commando versus Gorilla War! Winner! Gorilla War! Don't get me wrong, I do like Commando, but it doesn't have a lot of depth. The same four levels repeat, there's no vehicles to drive and just one upgradable weapon. Guerrilla War is also much more appealing graphically, having a lot more detail in the backgrounds and character sprites. And of course, I like the boss fights at the end of each level. I like little touches like the map screen and these guys that come in and throw you to your next mission. I like the tanks that you get to use and all the different weapons that you can wield. Also, if the enemies in Commando don't get you, the lung cancer will. Overall, Guerrilla War is just a better experience and one that you should play. <laughs> Final Fantasy on the NES versus Fantasy Star on the Sega Master System. Which is the better 8-bit RPG with the word fantasy in the title? Final Fantasy was originally released in Japan on December 18, 1987, and it wasn't brought over to the US until 1990. Thanks to the success of Dragon's Quest in Japan, Square went ahead with its very own RPG. It's called Final Fantasy because the creator at the time felt this would be the final game that he would ever work on. Thankfully for everyone, it wasn't. The game starts off by requiring that you choose your character's class and then name them all. The story is that the princess has been kidnapped and you need to rescue her. The overhead scenes are decent. It's easy to talk to people and enter buildings and things of that nature. Shopping is done from a side view and it's easy enough to deal with, though certainly not robust. You also buy magic spells at a shop in this manner. I thought this was kind of weird though. Apparently this is all one town and not six towns. Oh well. The battles are also side view. You can target the enemy that you want to attack. But the problem is, if the enemy you targeted gets killed before you attack, you don't automatically move on to an enemy that's still alive. So you're gonna need to carefully plan which characters attack which enemies. Normally, you need to go to the inn to recover and save your game. But you can buy a tent and recover a little HP or a cabin where you can recover all of it. These also let you save just about anywhere. The game can be pretty grindy, but you'll gain levels in no time. Also, you end up rescuing that princess rather quickly, and then you're off to fulfill the needs of other people throughout the land. The graphics deserve neither praise nor scorn. They get the job done. The music is good, but it's really, really simple. It probably maxes out at only two sound channels, maybe three. Still, it's a good RPG for NES players. Fantasy Star on the Sega Master System was released only two days later than Final Fantasy in Japan. It came to the US in 1988 and it was one of the first JRPGs on any console in the West. The story follows Alice as she tries to avenge her murdered brother who was killed by Lassic. You start out extremely weak and it's quite the grind fest at first. But if you keep at it, you'll have acquired two additional characters within the first hour of gameplay. Walking around the towns and the environment all takes place with an overhead perspective. Pretty much everything else is in the first person. Talking to people, buying items from shops, and even fighting battles. The best part is that the dungeons are all in first person. This is quite a feat for an 8-bit console and it looks pretty damn good. Unfortunately, these dungeons will require you to map them out on graph paper or otherwise have a really, really good memory. The battles are cool and there are quite a lot of different enemies. I like how, depending on where you are on the overworld, the battle backgrounds will vary. 
The graphics all around are excellent and some of the best for the entire 8-bit generation. The music is exceptional as well and it helps you feel lonely in spots and adventurous in others. The game's pace can be slow sometimes as you wonder what to do next. Sadly, you can't decide which enemy to target in battle and the CPU always chooses for you. And it doesn't always choose well either. You can save anywhere you want for free except for in battle with five different save slots. This is an outstanding game that nobody can deny was way ahead of its time. Final Fantasy versus Fantasy Star! Winner! Fantasy Star! Seriously, it's no contest here. Fantasy Star wins in every single category. The staff of Final Fantasy must have been embarrassed to see Fantasy Star on the rival system released only two days later as it really puts the work that they did to shame. Fantasy Star also has at least some semblance of character development. It also really looks like a 16-bit game in comparison with the original Final Fantasy. But of course, the top suits didn't care because there were way more Famicom and NES owners than there were Master System owners. Still, even though Fantasy Star is by far the better experience, Final Fantasy isn't a horrible game. It's very basic, but there's still a lot of fun to be had there. Alright, there's Game Battle 2 in the bag, and we had some really damn close ones there. Yeah, very close, and actually I had a lot of fun playing some of them, especially uh, Mass Destruction and Return Fire. I, God, both those games are really freaking awesome, but there had to be one. There, there always has to be a winner, and you know, when you play games like Contra, Hardcore, and Gunstar mm. Heroes, oh, you, you, you have to pick one. Yeah. You know, they can't just be as good as each other. No, one's got to be better. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and they're this close. They're like... <laughs> Yeah. So, but anyways, it was fun. Yeah. What games would you guys like to see put head to head? Let us know. And in the meantime, thank you for watching Game Sack. first episode of Game Sack we made, we made that the same day the Nintendo 3DS was brand new. Yeah, the first time we shot Game Sack and a new console came out, what a great day. Life was looking up. Dave, do you still have your Nintendo 3DS? Hell no, Joe. I've got the new 3DS. Whoa, the new 3DS? Nintendo came out with a new 3DS? Yeah, about two years ago. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is two years old. This is two years old. Dave, you can't call something that's two years old the new 3DS. But it is the new 3DS, Joe. So, wait, you're saying that in the year 2175, that will still be the new 3DS? This will always and forever be the new 3DS. You know, Dave, I might be interested in acquiring a new 3DS. Would it be possible for me to get an old new 3DS? Of course you can get an old new 3DS. What a stupid question. Well, you know what's even more stupid, Dave, is why would I get the new 3DS when I can just wait for the newer 3DS? A newer 3DS? Of course, you know they're going to come out with the newer 3DS. That would be a dumb name for a system. I gotta go.